on the want to welcome all to this workshop, the day two of our workshop, and I hope we're going to have a wonderful workshop today. We had a wonderful day yesterday, and uh, we're certainly going to have an even greater day today. Um, this morning, we're going to open as we normally do, you know, invite the Lord's presence into the workshop so we might have his blessings and, you know, all the presentations may be to our benefit. So as is the norm, we will start with prayer. Almighty, okay. everlasting Father, I just want to invite your presence here today. We ask that all that is said will be to your honor and to your glory, and that the participants will have a wonderful time and will certainly benefit from all that is said today. Thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, your son, we pray, amen. Again, let me just thank you all for joining us today at this talk exchange for another day of this workshop, um, the Caribbean Environmental Workshop. We hope you'll enjoy a wonderful day, a day will, which will have great display of information, information that can only help you and guide you as we move forward on our daily basis in our professional lives and hope that it will be to your benefit, all redound to your benefit. Today, we will have our first speaker, again, um, very knowledgeable, somebody who has great knowledge of the systems and and we certainly are going to ask that you pay great attention today as he presents us with the wonderful um, information that they have researched and prepared for you today. Our first speaker today is Mr. Fred Seifert. Let's hope I'm getting it right. Fred has been working with NIN since about 2011 and leads their Caribbean operations. Throughout his time, Fred has um, been part of over 100 projects. Now that's something. Having assessed several LAC um, and NIN's ESG assessment methodologies, uh, Fred conducted E and S potential investees to private equity fund. He has led research. Um, so yes, he, he, he has done a myriad of things in this in this um, era. Um, he has led research projects directly related with sustainable finance. Um, he has elaborated um, GSS bonds and SOPs. Engage with um, lacks key stakeholders in these teams. He has, he's a specialist in environmental and social management risk for banks. He's authored guides on the themes for the Brazilian Development Association and Eco Business Fund, EBF. Fred has led or been a part of more than 400 projects. Wow, can you just imagine that? all over the Latin American and Caribbean region, with clients in Argentina, Barbados, Bolivia, Colombia, Ecuador, El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, Panama, Paraguay. Boy, this man has been to it. He has done everything and has worked pretty much everywhere. Fred is also a tutor in a UNEP course in climate change. Now, I tell you, Fred has done it all. Um, he's worked with the Brazilian Development Bank. He's a master's degree in public policy at Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, where he also obtained his BSc in economics. You know, today I think we're about to be blessed. We are blessed to have such a speaker on this workshop today. And I dare say, I'm excited 
to hear this presentation. So let's just, without further ado, welcome Fred to the program. Fred, all over to you, sir. Thanks a lot, Nelson, for the very flattering uh, introduction. Uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, Fred Seifert, um, head of Latin America and the Caribbean for uh, NAMES. I'm going to share my screen to see if that works properly. I believe it does so. Um, so the idea uh, today is to present uh, to you a little bit on the findings of a research uh, we have done with uh, Jamaica Stock Exchange about um, the state of the art of uh, green, sustainable, uh, social, and sustainability link, uh, the GESSS bonds uh, in the Caribbean, and possibilities to move forward. Uh, right, so I'm going to talk on this first session a little bit on the diagnosis, what we have seen um, as the most important in terms of what is going on, uh, the gaps um, for the, the region to, to move forward. And I'll get back uh, on uh, a shorter session um, uh, towards the end of this uh, day, talk a little bit on this way forward. So uh, first of all, just let me introduce uh, NIMT uh, before uh, everything. We are uh, the largest uh, consulting firm um, in Latin America and the Caribbean dedicated to sustainable finance. We have worked uh, in the past few years under um, uh, the name of Sitawi, um, but uh, we're still the, the, the same company, basically. We are over 100 professionals, uh, all dedicated to sustainable finance. We have offices in Rio, Sao Paulo, uh, Bogota in, in Quito and work uh, in the entire region. We have been working in over 20 countries, many of them uh, in the Caribbean, um, in Jamaica specifically. And we do basically everything within this agenda of sustainable finance, um, from research and evaluation uh, to um, consulting services tailor-made to the necessities of our clients. In uh, the case of um, GESSS bonds, we have been uh, pioneers uh, in the market in the region. We have been on um, ahead of the agenda in Brazil, which is nowadays one of the most, uh, one of the biggest markets um, in the region in, in, in bonds. And we have been working with several countries in the region both on structuring uh, such missions, uh, issuances, such as uh, identifying a portfolio and helping the, um, uh, the issuers to really comply with international best practices to make it feasible to, to make such issuance. And we have been working on the other side, uh, also verifying, um, uh, providing second prior readings um, to uh, state that certain issuances are really green, social, sustainable, or sustainability linked. We have been working uh, uh, side by side with Climate Bonds Initiative. It's, it's good to, it's great to have them here. Um, so um, it, it's a little bit for you to understand why we have been selected to conduct this, um, this uh, research. And, uh, and then you can understand a little bit better on the findings. So let's go to, to the findings uh, on this first session. I'll focus on them for the different countries under the scope of this uh, assessment. And I'm going to mention them um, uh, a little bit ahead. Um, and also want to talk a little bit on the main stakeholders that we have interviewed and have identified as uh, important stakeholders for uh, the discussion of the subject and of course to move forward with uh, GSSS markets within um, the Caribbean. So just a quick reminder, I uh, believe that Marina um, uh, has done an amazing job uh, yesterday uh, introducing the concept of uh, GSSS bonds, but for you who haven't been there or um, 
who just want uh, to be refreshed about uh, the subject. So um, uh, we uh, we see green bonds uh, as regular bonds. Um, so you can have any type of uh, standard debt securities uh, instruments that could be labeled uh, as green, depending on the use of the resources, right? So there's no financial difference uh, between uh, a standard bond and a green bond, um, except the use of the resources. So if you are using this, uh, these resources to generate a um, uh, green positive impact or social positive impact or both, so you are talking about green sustainable or uh, social bonds. Uh, we have the sustainability linked bonds as well, who are not specifically related to the use of resources, but are uh, related to goals established by the issuer. Uh, and those define uh, specifically the, 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 um, um, the financial aspects of the bond. For instance, if the issuer has a better uh, financial performance, it has better financial conditions uh, in the issuance of the bond. So uh, it's more about the um, use of the proceeds than the instrument per se. And in the region, uh, we have a lot of potential sectors that could benefit uh, from this um, from these issuances. Um, some of them are aligned to what we see uh, in the world uh, in general, such as renewable energy, clean transportation, um, which are the main use of uh, receipts uh, all around the world. But it's interesting to see that we have uh, a few other um, sectors that um, are not so representative in terms of issuances all around the world, but are representative in terms of Latin American Caribbean issuances, such as land use, environmental man uh, management, and water and wastewater. Um, this is due, of course, uh, the characteristics of the region and the challenges we face, but it's good uh, to know that because uh, it shows how flexible are those instruments. First, uh, of course, because they are uh, traditional instruments, they are put to uh, this specific use of generating green uh, social or both um, positive impact. And the second one is uh, that you can use the proceeds to really finance different types of sectors projects depending on the needs, uh, on the capacity of the issuer uh, to fulfill these um, um, social environmental objectives. So just to refresh you uh, a little bit on GSS uh, S bonds, and now we can talk about specifically the research that we have made um, for uh, the Caribbean countries. So what we wanted to do with this research so we wanted to map uh, green uh, GSSS bonds. In many cases, I'm going to mention green bonds, um, but please understand green bonds as a metonym for GSSS bonds because it's easier <laughs> to talk uh, to say just green bonds. So um, we wanted to map uh, the green bond market uh, and their actors in the region. Uh, we did that via desk research, but we also interviewed um, uh, many stakeholders. We uh, contacted them um, via questionnaires, uh, surveys, and etc. So with that, we wanted to understand what was going on in the region, try to maybe identify uh, potential sectors, uh, even a portfolio of projects that could um, sustain issues or some issuances in the region with that understand the status and develop a taxonomy, identify which are the main sectors that could be leveraged by the issuance of, um, uh, of green bonds in the region, identify various opportunities and next steps and present that to you today. So it was really trying to understand how things are going right now in the region and what can be done 
to um, advance with issuances uh, and the performance of green bond markets in the region. So we car uh, carried out um, interviews mostly by the end of last year. Um, we uh, interviewed banks, uh, government uh, parties, uh, multilateral banks as well as uh, investors and in real sector um, uh, companies from Jamaica, Barbados, Trinidad and Tobago, and Suriname. Uh, and we also sent surveys um, to all of these actors uh, from these four countries, but also from St. Lucia and Dominica. So we had uh, these interviews to complement the desk research. And um, the findings, it's good, uh, the findings are good on that sense because they are what we see when someone from the outside look um, uh, at the market with the public information available. But we also gather information from the sectors, first-hand information from the sectors in the uh, different six countries of the assessment and to see if they have plans to issue uh, green bonds, what are the hurdles uh, they have in issuing uh, such type of bonds, and what are the opportunities they see uh, in the region to uh, promote more issuances, to leverage uh, green social system projects in their respective countries. So uh, what we are going to see here are the milestones in the main countries of the assessment and a little bit of the barriers and opportunities that these countries have in uh, developing their markets. So let's start with um, Jamaica. Uh, so we um, have seen that uh, Jamaica uh, uh, banking sector and the capital markets are um, a reference uh, in the region. But um, as we get to see in many other countries, uh, there's um, a knowledge uh, there's the need to improve knowledge regarding um, green bonds uh, in the country. And this in terms of um, providing not only information about what is a green bond, but the importance of uh, such instruments to the development of the country. In many cases, we see that uh, markets are reluctant uh, to issue uh, green bonds instead of the traditional or uh, how we call it, uh, vanilla bonds, because uh, they don't see, first of all, we can have um, uh, underlying issues uh, for the issuance of such bonds, such as not having uh, a portfolio or pipeline of green social sustainable projects that could uh, support the issuance. That's on one side. But in many cases, uh, there's not um, enough understanding of why to issue um, a, a, a green bond for those projects instead of uh, a regular bond. So what lacks here is really understanding uh, the benefits of the green bonds. And I say that to Jamaica, but uh, it, it affects all countries um, within uh, um, uh, the scope of this research. So. Uh, what we need here uh, in Jamaica is what we have in today, dialogues uh, with different uh, stakeholders to have this, uh, uh, to really subscribe the importance of green bond issuances to uh, support projects uh, in the country. So that could lead, uh, lead to dialogues to develop a national sustainable finance policy to address climate change uh, issues, for instance. Um, it could show commitment of key stakeholders um, to help support that, that market. Uh, at the same time, these dialogues serve as awareness raising on uh, sustainable topics. There may be um, gaps in knowledge needed to be fulfilled before the issuance of, um, of such bonds. A taxonomy for the region could be interesting as well. One of the underlying problems in, um, in issuing these bonds, as I mentioned, 
is the lack of uh, underlying portfolio pipeline of projects. In many cases, it's not there. They're not um, uh, projects uh, that could be categorized as green, but there is no information if, uh, or references if the, pros, uh, the projects that have been seen in the country are really green or not, right? So with the taxonomy, the characteristics of a green social sustainable projects are well-defined and are disseminated among uh, stakeholders. So they really understand if the portfolio, the pipeline of projects they have are uh, is sufficient to uh, to make a green bond uh, issuance. So the development of this taxonomy, we uh, helped uh, the Jamaican Stock Exchange uh, on a first draft of that. We hope that uh, this document could be uh, circulated and put um, into discussion. Um, so it makes it easier for um, the, the stakeholders, the market actors to really understand if they have the potential to issue a green bond. And if not, what are the sectors uh, that could lead to a green bond issuance? And on the other hand, as I mentioned on capacity building, awareness rating, raising, understanding why to do so, why to issue a green bond instead, instead of uh, a traditional one. So Jamaica has worked in uh, identifying green financing uh, opportunities with uh, different uh, national policies, uh, national plans um, uh, as well. So with that, we see a series of incentives for uh, real sectors to work in green, uh, um, in green, in green projects, in social projects. Uh, in fact, we have seen some opportunities materializing uh, in the country um, over the, the, the last uh, few years. For example, uh, the Jamaica government last year uh, launched this Green Bond project to uh, facilitate and enabling uh, environment for the Caribbean Green Bond listing. Um, so it is an understanding that the country has the potential to develop green projects and also to foster those projects, to facilitate their implementation and their financing, there is this specific um, financial instrument that could be used. So uh, this, this program is helping uh, to identify and finance projects in energy efficiency, clean transportation, pollution prevention, agriculture, and many other uh, sectors. Um, it's also um, the, the case in the region to really balance um, these green projects with uh, traditional projects or um, uh, fossil fuel projects. We understand that Jamaica has a challenge on that sense, uh, since it depends a lot on uh, fossil fuel imported uh, fossil fuel. So um, at the same time, the, there is uh, this situation, there's the opportunity to transition to a cleaner uh, energy matrix, which could be leveraged by the resources uh, from green bonds. That is important. It's not the only way of doing things, but it's an important alternative for uh, the financing needs uh, of a country, of, uh, of a sector. For uh, example, we have here other uh, possibilities working with uh, multilateral banks, such as IDB, we have the Green Climate Fund and Jamaica has a few projects that have been approved by the fund, um, uh, being part of, uh, uh, of broader projects involving uh, different, uh, different uh, countries in the Caribbean. So in these projects, they refer to different sectors such as energy, but also uh, adapting to climate change and uh, saving uh, a specific um, um, ecosystems. So it's um, the green bonds uh, offer a possibility of in providing more resources to the funding mix that the country already has. So uh, in the case of Jamaica, we have seen a lot of potential. We have seen a lot of movement uh, towards this path of uh, creating a more sustainable financial sector. And we have seen opportunities to um, overcome these challenges such as the one 
we have seen on the energy matrix. Um, analyzing Barbados was interesting because it was, it is, uh, to this day, the um, only country that has an issue of uh, green bond. Um, that actually, uh, it was more than one bond. It was uh, two bonds from the same uh, uh, company, Williams Caribbean Capital, focused on solar um, energy. So um, it might come as the result of um, they have a, a series of initiatives from uh, the country and the different actors in the country to identify new green financing uh, opportunities. Uh, there are uh, there are put, for example, in the natural national strategic plan of Barbados until 2025. So there is uh, a plan focused on building uh, a green economy, for instance. Uh, and we have seen a lot of movement as well on the regulatory framework for different sectors. But of course, this makes uh, it easier for real um, uh, sector, for real economy uh, companies to develop their green projects or blue economy projects. Um, and with that, uh, of course, the the banks uh, could finance and them um, creating green credit lines, which could be um, uh, could support the issuance of a green bond, or investors and the companies themselves could uh, directly uh, issue uh, a green social sustainable bonds as well. So, in the case of Barbados, of course, its maritime space uh, represents uh, a great uh, opportunity. Um, for the country. So it's what we call a blue economy, uh, which is foreseen in the uh, national development plans of the country. Of course, uh, with that, we can talk about different sectors that could be explored, tourism, uh, harvesting of um, uh, living resources, or shipping, uh, ocean health, and etc. And we have seen a lot of movement on that sense from different actors to really uh, uh, support the development of a blue economy in the country. Uh, Dominica uh, has um, um, a lot to move forward uh, um, to, to really develop uh, a stronger, uh, a stronger uh, financial market. We understand that uh, the country doesn't have, for example, a local stock exchange but it's interesting to know uh, this strategic, strategic decision of the government to work with the government of Jamaica uh, to provide a listing of um, um, uh, potential green bonds in the country, also in the Jamaica Stock Exchange. So uh, it's a country that uh, has been working a lot on the resilience uh, to uh, climate change. So, uh, adaptation projects as it's important to mention that that adaptation might be more important than uh, mitigation for um, um, our countries in the region, Latin America, and especially the Caribbean, because of course, uh, the country in the Caribbean, of course, it's always important to minimize um, emissions, greenhouse gases emissions, but we understand that the countries in the Caribbean are more exposed climate change, and you have seen that uh, firsthand, um, then they contribute to climate change. So uh, it's always important to mitigate, but it's uh, in this particular case, it's important to adapt to the impacts of climate change. And we have seen that Dominica, for instance, uh, has been working in this national resilient development strategy with um, different targets, for uh, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, to boost uh, uh, their resilience to climate change and have more projects that could help them to adapt to climate change. So once again, um, it's um, the green bonds could help a lot uh, the country in fostering those projects. Um, we have seen the country working once again with GCF, with different, uh, with their own resources. Uh, and the, the, the thing here and a key opportunity is that Dominica has this great plan of uh, 
running entirely on renewables uh, by 2030. So uh, it's a really interesting uh, a moment to discuss how the green bonds could be used to fulfill part of this uh, overall objective, providing uh, more resources to uh, the fulfillment of this plan. And of course, other objectives established by uh, national companies and national financial institutions. Trinidad and Tobago, uh, uh, the country um, does not have, uh, it's interesting, it doesn't have a formal framework or a regulatory framework for many uh, sustainable um, finance issues, uh, specifically for uh, green bonds. But um, it's inter interesting to see that uh, the central bank uh, of the country has been working in different sets of guidelines. For example, a guide for risk management, including environmental risks for financial institutions. So it's important uh, that it gives a, an example that we don't have to wait to have specific regulations. We don't have to wait to have um, uh, specific movements from uh, regulators and the government. The uh, financial sector and real economy sectors could move us as well as we have seen in Barbados with uh, uh, their first issues, as we are seeing here with Trinidad and Tobago with those guide guidelines, principles that could be uh, used by the different uh, stakeholders, actors in the financial sector to really promote uh, sustainable finance, even though there is no formal requirement. In fact, most of the countries in the region uh, began like this, began with uh, initiatives from specific actors uh, to work on those issues. And then uh, with uh, uh, the materialization, with the strengthening of their capacities, uh, that moved to establish some uh, common ground, uh, ground rules for the country that eventually led to uh, regulations. And these regulations, of course, once established they advance more and more to have more specific requirements. And these specific requirements uh, are in line with uh, what uh, market actors could offer, um, but also they help push uh, these sectors to do more. Because if I'm complying with uh, the law, I'm just complying, of course. If I want to uh, differentiate from other market actors, I, want, I need to do more. So it's important to have this movement that once again, it doesn't need to start from regulators, from the government, the uh, different market actors could work uh, as well to, um, uh, to establish those principles guidelines for uh, the sector as a whole. So um, it's uh, interesting to see that one, uh, one actor from, um, from the sector, a big commercial bank, for example, already uh, is already participating in the Net Zero Banking Alliance. Uh, it is for citizens uh, a bank. It's interesting to see that because we have these major initiatives in, uh, in the world about sustainable finance. There are many, there are plenty. Uh, but uh, Net Zero Banking Alliance is uh, an important one. And it's really good to see a Caribbean bank uh, working uh, hand, uh, hand in hand with this initiative, establishing uh, such a goal to be uh, carbon neutral in the next few years. And it shows that it's possible to do so uh, within uh, the region. Uh, in the stock exchange of Trinidad Baco as well, has provided uh, incentives and signals that companies should include SDGs. Uh, the SDG, SDG is uh, their own goals for uh, the activities. So it's interesting to see that um, uh, actors in Trinidad and Tobago are working to uh, incorporate these international best practices within their own practices. St. Lucia uh, has the development of a green board market um, as a transversal uh, goal for their national plans. Uh, so they see uh, the, the development of green bonds as um, a way to promote resources for this, uh, for, their, for their plans. On the other hand, the country 
has not a lot of plans in the specific commitments for the financial sector on that sense. But once again, I mentioned that uh, the, the different actors could work um, to promote uh, 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 sustainable finance issues without uh, uh, or the support, not maybe not the, the, the formal support, but of course, the government is interested uh, in supporting uh, the agenda in different ways. And the country has uh, developed uh, different studies on green economy. They are really rich. Uh, to understand the specific needs uh, and capacities of the country to uh, seize opportunities related to uh, the sustainable finance agenda. So uh, we have identified some key sectors that could be in benefit from this uh, agenda, such as agriculture, tourism, construction, uh, manufacturing as well. So um, uh, once again, green bonds could compose an interesting uh, finance mix uh, for the country who is already accessing uh, uh, funds from the Green Climate Fund for, uh, for a project in renewable energy. And we have seen the government uh, per se uh, rolling out different projects related to, to build uh, this flow of climate finance into the country. And the last country, of the analysis was Suriname. Um, Suriname has already uh, is already working with its banking sector to identify key issues related to credit currency, liquidity, open, operational interest, uh, in consideration risks. Um, they haven't been working specifically with environmental social risks, but uh, we have uh, we haven't seen that there's a lot of interest, in, interest on those uh, issues in the country. Uh, for instance, Unibify has been working with the government, with uh, the banking uh, sector in the country specifically to promote uh, this capacity building and awareness raising sessions in themes such as uh, management of environmental social risks, um, uh, implementation of TCFD, the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures by financial institutions in the country and to, uh, for them to really understand climate issues more specifically. Uh, and uh, of course, the country has been working in different projects with uh, uh, the Green Environmental Facility as well to improve the environmental uh, management of sectors that are uh, that could generate a lot of impact, such as the mining sector. Uh, gold mining is a, a key um, uh, economic activity in the country, and it has been working also to foster new economic activities with the revenue of uh, sectors that are traditional sectors uh, that could generate a negative impact. But uh, the country is trying to develop these plans to use the resources from oil and gas, mining, and etc to consolidate a uh, sustainable energy sector in Sweden. So these different examples from different countries are interesting to see that even though uh, each individual country uh, does not, cannot be put as a reference in sustainable finance, every single country is working in their own way with their own capacities, but they are all working, they are aiming at being more sustainable, working with sustainable finance because they have identified this as one side of risk uh, for uh, uh, the development of the activities, the economic activities of the country and financial institutions have identified environmental social issues as important risk for the development of such activities. And they have also identified them as key opportunities to advance um, with their economies. So, Having these specific examples from different countries show that the region as a whole is aware that we have this agenda and is aware in general that the green bonds uh, could help them to move forward uh, with them. Uh, so the green bonds could help uh, um, develop more green social sustainable projects uh, and uh, they are also a financial opportunity for the issuers such as uh, financial institutions to complement their uh, funding, uh, their funding, right? So we have seen opportunities here, of course, to advance with regulatory frameworks, 
uh, in round tables uh, to discuss what are the main the main issues that um, affect the the countries and could uh, be established uh, and where could be established a set of ground rules to uh, really minimize those uh, those impacts and move forward with the agenda. We have seen those, uh, on the other hand, market opportunities such as development of green financial lines and the issues of green bonds, uh, of course. Uh, but that requires capacity building, that requires um, uh, support to comply with uh, ESG commitments, um, not only on the regulatory framework side, but on the participation of international initiatives. And all of that uh, should be translated to action plans that uh, we're going to be talking about that uh, more to the end of this, uh, uh, of this session. Uh, but it's important to have this action plan for the region as a whole, but um, of course, we're uh, considering the US synchronicities of each country, so we can move forward, uh, seizing the opportunities there are there for each one of them. So just uh, in two minutes to mention the, the role of the, the different uh, actors that could be uh, um, supported here. So the government, of course, could provide uh, this regulatory framework, but could also uh, provide incentives, uh, signals that green and blue issues are important for the country. So uh, to, for them to be considered by real economy companies, for them to be considered by um, financial institutions. And of course, all of this should be reflected in uh, their commitments and development plans and public policies. Um, so with that, a new flow of investments, climate financing could be, uh, uh, could be attracted to the different countries. Financial institutions have this uh, great role of facilitating um, uh, the implementation of these opportunities because uh, the impact of financial institutions, the direct impact on climate change, on green and social issues, uh, is reduced, but indirect impact in terms of financing the different uh, sectors that generate those impacts is enormous. So uh, here, the financial institutions could uh, provide uh, more resources, provide signals that um, uh, it's important for uh, the companies to integrate environmental social issues to the development of their projects on one hand, to reduce risks, of course, but on the other hand, to uh, uh, seize opportunities such as obtaining more resources from the financial institutions that uh, on their turn, obtain those resources from funding partners that require uh, the fulfillment of, um, of, uh, uh, of uh, guidelines of safeguards, uh, uh, green and social ones. So providing uh, this is uh, important um, on the financial institution side. And of course, that could lead to opportunities such as identifying in this risk management opportunities with uh, the sectors they already work with, uh, providing new credit lines, and et cetera. The development of multilateral banks has uh, had this uh, important uh, role as well in providing these funding resources for financial institutions but also financing directly uh, projects um, in the country, providing resources for the government to really understand the, the issues in the country and help develop this uh, um, guidelines, set of guidelines, um, rules, uh, laws and arms and et cetera. So they have this, let's say, catalyzing um, uh, responsibility of, um, in many cases, working with a different, uh, with a single financial institution, with a single project, and with uh, working with these uh, specific actors, they promote uh, practices, policies that should be uh, implemented by the uh, financial institution to all of their projects, by the, uh, the, the developer of a specific project to all of their uh, projects as well. And they serve as reference for uh, the rest of the actors as good practices to be followed. And finally, the real sector, of course, um, integrating environmental social issues 
to the development of their projects is on one side, reducing risks uh, in this, uh, of course, the physical uh, risks of climate change and other environmental social risks, but it's also preparing to uh, risks related to regulation, uh, technological changes, demands by the market. So on the risk side is uh, not only complying with laws and standards that exist today, but also preparing to demands uh, and new uh, regulations, norms, and et cetera, that will exist in a short to medium term. And on the other hand, you can also, of course, seize opportunities such as accessing more and more resources, uh, uh, having these more uh, sustainable projects could lead to access, uh, facilitated access with banks, with funds, and of course, this could also allow the, the development of uh, the issuance of green bonds. So I'll stop here. The, my next uh, contribution is going to be the way forward, uh, a little bit on the, um, uh, the action plan or the roadmap that we have foreseen for the region. And of course, if you have any questions, you can send me a chat, uh, feel free to, to let me know. Thanks a lot for the attention. Thank you very much, Federico. That was a very interesting presentation filled with lots of information. And I'm sure the guests will have questions for you. Um, but this, these are the rules, though. This is how we intend to you know, uh, proceed with the question and answer session. So what we want you to do, if you have questions, raise your hand, uh, hit the raise hand button, let's identify you or put the question in the chat and, and let us um, put the question forward. Um, again, let us just thank um, Frederico for that wonderful presentation, um, chock filled with information. Um, and we're hoping that you're excited, as excited about this session as I am. All right, so let's hear it. Any questions in this session? All right. Um, it seems the presentation was that good, Frederico. <laughs> it seems the presentation was that good that everybody is just um, as as I said, it was very clear and informative. So that 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 speaks volumes to the presentation that you put forward for us here today. Um, let us just thank you, um, Frederico. And I know we, we, we're gonna talk again with you later on in the program as we look at the way forward. So maybe the questions will come then. Um, so again, thanks for the uh, quality of the presentation. It was excellent, if I must say so myself. Um, we're gonna be moving on then. And, uh, you know, um, we have a nice agenda set up here for us today. Uh, the next topic we're going to be looking at is hurdles and opportunities. Um, really a guided discussion on uh, opportunities. Yes, sir. We have an honorary um, Jones. Repeat. Are you taking the question? Are you taking question now, Mr. Laser E. Jones, who raises hand? Oh. Okay, I, I, I didn't see that. All right, so we'll take, we'll take your question. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Frederico. And E. Jones is not a he, it's a she, as you can figure out. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to, to say to Frederico, thank you very much for the very detailed and, and thorough presentation. A lot of, lot of findings there. And um, I just, um, each country has its peculiarities, of course, but I wondered whether there was any one cross-cutting issue that that stood out for you. Um, there's some that I, I, I saw, but from your dialogue and going through each one of the
countries, is there any one cross-cutting issue, any um, underlying that perhaps you could say applies to all, um, notwithstanding the peculiarities of each? Okay, thanks a lot uh, for the question. Uh, there is one, of course, uh, the, the assessment was focused on the GSS as bonds. So, of course, in sustainable finance, we could also find different issues uh, that should be dealt with and the countries are dealing with. But in GSS as bonds, one of the main aspects that has been raised by all countries are, um, we have seen that just Barbados uh, has uh, issued uh, a green bond. Um, and there's a reason for that. Um, the first one is that the countries have difficulty, um, the different actors from the different countries have difficulty in understanding, um, in identifying uh, green projects. Um, so it's not there, they do not exist, but, um, they haven't been labeled in many cases as green projects. So uh, when they are properly labeled, um, they are not enough in terms of uh, amount to justify uh, an issuance in many cases. So it's important to go there and show uh, what are green projects, social projects, sustainable projects, and et cetera. So that what is the importance of what I mentioned. Uh, uh, for the, the importance of the tax number. And the second reason uh, is that there's not enough information specifically for the Caribbean, uh, let alone for each specific country of the benefits of issuing a green bond. Uh, it's of course uh, something natural because uh, it's a relatively new market compared to other financial instruments, uh, especially in Latin America and the Caribbean. We have seen a great work from uh, Climate Bonds Initiative, for instance, in identifying these benefits, such as uh, the greenium or the redux reduction of the price premium, which, uh, which means basically that investors accept to receive less uh, if they're uh, uh, financing green social projects. Uh, the existence of a green halo, uh, which means that uh, the issuance of a green bond affects not only the, the cost of the one specific issuance, but investors understand that um, issuers of a green bond have the capacity of incorporating environmental social issues to all of their management. So the, the reduction of the cost of um, lending money is reduced to the entire, uh, to all issuances, not to the specific green one. So we have seen this effect and we have seen uh, this assessment with specific cases with quantitative analysis from climate bonds for more mature markets, such as Europe, uh, United States. But there's this information is lacking, of course, because we have less uh, quantitative uh, quantity of issuances uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean. So it's important to uh, be aware of those issues and provide more and more information as soon as we have those bonds to show that there are financial benefits, there are reputation benefits in issuing those, those bonds. So basically those uh, two issues, identifying a pipeline, uh, a portfolio of projects, and to identify the benefits of issuing a green bond instead of, instead of a traditional bond. Thank you again, Federico. Uh, Thank you. Mm -hmm. Jones, um, I hope that answers your question. Um, uh, yes, it does. And, and what it really emphasizes is the need for awareness building and, and capacity building, which, which Frederica had listed as one of the categories. And I, I just wondered if he saw that as a, a cross cut. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Um, Sandrina said it was very clear and info informative. And that's speaking to Federico's presentation. And Ms. Jones also said, thank you, Federico. Thorough and detailed findings. Vindel Kerr, Kerr said, good morning. When learners have a very low knowledge level of a new topic, it is usually different for them to ask beneficial questions. And I understand that. I would also suggest that the speakers pause at particular junctures to take one or few questions and move on. 
they may have better success with obtaining questions from attendees. I will take that. We note um, the point that you're making and we take that. We also see um, Giselle Hall at Razor. And Giselle, you have a question for us? Um, yes, actually, I had put the question in the Q&A section. Um, thank you again, Frederico, and just echoing the sentiments of the other attendees. Um, my question is more general. Um, can you speak more on the role of environmental NGOs um, in this green bond space and this ESG space based on your findings? Yeah, of course. Uh, NGOs and organized civil society have uh, a few very important roles uh, that could be um, that could be taken uh, in the region. One, of course, is to uh, activism or pressure uh, companies, financial institutions, regulators to uh, really incorporate this agenda um, to their uh, development of the rules, to their investment decisions, to their policies and practices, to develop their uh, economic um, activities. So this uh, uh, raising those issues and pressure them to incorporate, uh, considering the movements that we have seen uh, in other countries, the commitments that have been established by uh, these own countries. Um, so it's a very important goal. Uh, second of all, NGOs, the civil society could also work hand by hand with uh, regulators in terms of being consulted in participating uh, in consultations to um, identify what are the main environmental social aspects relevant for a country um, um, uh, what are uh, what is the importance of uh, specific uh, actors uh, and issues for the development plans of the country uh, and etc. So it's a really important uh, uh, concerning party to the development of those rules. And of course, within uh, companies and financial institutions should be consulted as well. And once again, should pressure to be consulted in the development of their policies and practice and et cetera. And third, we have seen that many civil society organizations and NGOs are also uh, an important source of, of information uh, of these new issues for um, uh, the different market actors and stakeholders. For example, we could mention a lot of work uh, being done by environmental NGOs, WWF, TNC, uh, international ones, but also national ones working specifically with uh, each country, mentioning what are the main challenges, such as uh, deforestation and the gap of financing uh, to reduce deforestation or blue economy and et cetera. So this is also an important role that could be taken, that should be taken by the civil society and NGOs which are a key actor uh, for the development of the sustainable finance markets uh, in all of the countries. All right. Thank you, Federico. And again, um, I hope that answers the question. Giselle, I hope you're satisfied. Um, and again, it was an excellent presentation by Federico and um, good questions also as we, you know, look to expand our knowledge, as somebody said. The era is new for many, but we're looking to expand our knowledge. All right, so we're moving right along and into the next session. We will be looking to go, um, we're talking about hurdles and opportunities. We're looking at a guided discussions on hurdles and opportunities for GB in the Caribbean. We're looking at regulations and market initiative, investor demands, identification of projects, pre and post obligations, and others. And of course, this, this section is going to be led by a very able and qualified speaker. Um, in, this, in this area, we're talking about a speaker, Marina Barkey who is currently Climate Bond's LATAM Stakeholder Relations Manager. Marina is a public affairs professional with more than 15 years experience working with the government and institutional affairs. A stakeholder mapping expert, she has specialized in political engagements and risk analysis. Currently, Maria leads Climate Bond's Stakeholder Relations Agenda for Latin America and the Caribbean region 
focusing on market development, strategic alliances, and stock exchanges. Previously, Marina led the domestic politics strategy for the Foreign and Commonwealth Office at the British Embassy in Brasilia, where she worked for seven years, having been responsible for its political engagement and for advising commercial teams. Marina also worked for public affairs consultancy, Concordia, managing projects in biotechnology, software, and health sectors. Previously, she worked for a multinational construction company and for New Zealand Embassy in Brazil. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in Public Relations and Public Policy and Management MPA from the Brazilian Institute of Education, Development and Research, IDP. Now, certainly you will all agree with me, panelists. There is no one more able and qualified to speak on this subject. And so without further ado, I want to welcome Maria to give us that wonderful presentation. Maria, all over to you. Thank you so much, Nelson. A very kind uh, presentation. And once again, I just wanted to thank the Jamaica T Stock Exchange uh, for this invitation, for inviting Climate Bonds. It's, uh, it's great to be here today. Thank you so much. Uh, let me share my presentation with you. Um, I did take note of uh, the issue about the question. So I can't see the screen when I put this up, but if someone has a question, uh, please, uh, Nelson or, or, or one of our colleagues, feel free to interrupt me and I'll try to pace my, my presentation as well. Um, so I just wanted to take you today through a bit more detail, uh, ex exactly what you mentioned. And uh, I think my, my colleague's uh, presentation, uh, Fred's presentation was fantastic in laying out uh, some of the, the pathways for raising awareness about green bonds and sustainable bonds, so GSSS bonds uh, here in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, and I brought today a few uh, policy milestones on sustainable finance. Uh, so sometimes, you know, best practice is uh, replicated uh, uh, across countries. Uh, so some of these initiatives could be used, for example, in Jamaica uh, to kickstart uh, the, the green bond market. Uh, so, for example, uh, in 2019, uh, Panama, the, the Panama Stock Exchange released its Green Social Sustainable Bond Guide. I, I know that uh, Jamaica did the same, the Jamaican government. Uh, so it's already a great starting point for investors and issuers to realize that a country is open to these types of, of investments in debt and labeled debt instruments. Um, Honduras uh, National Banking and Insurance Commission uh, set standards for financial institutions to manage environmental and social risk. This is also a good guideline of uh, including environmental risk in investments. And it's, been, it's being required by more and more um, institutions as well. Um, in 2019, also the Dominican Republic Stock Exchange launched the Green Bond Guide for its issuers. Uh, some of these stock exchanges are partners of Climate Bonds Initiative. Uh, I know that F uh, Fred mentioned uh, uh, capacity building and some of our, our attendees today as well. And this is, you know, Climate Bonds really believes that uh, we can raise awareness about uh, GSS bonds by building capacity. So we are available. We have trainings uh, for, for this as well, uh, for building capacity in the region. Um, in 2020, also the Panama Stock Exchange released its guidelines for voluntary reporting and disclosure of ESG factors. Uh, so as I mentioned in uh, yesterday's presentation, the importance and uh, really it's a key step in the process of issuing GSS bonds is reporting and monitoring how it's faring and really checking if it's uh, use of proceeds are being adequately uh, funded. 
and allocated. Uh, in 2020, also uh, Mexico issued the first sovereign SDG bond, so not linked to use of proceeds, but linked to uh, the UN social uh, uh, development um, goals. Um, Ecuador launched its sustainable finance initiative in 2020, and the Dominican Republic uh, produced the green bond guidelines to standardize the good practices for users. So again, uh, because the, the market is voluntary, uh, it's important to have these best practices in place, uh, really replicating from other countries uh, so that we can have a, a clear north uh, for investors and issuers. In 2021, uh, IDB launched the Green, Tra Green Bond Transparency Platform that I mentioned yesterday. It's, uh, it's a website that can be accessed with data about green bonds in the region. Uh, we contributed to, to building that. Um, and Brazil Central Bank launched the public consultation on TCF, TCDF uh, and climate risk. And then this year we had a few exciting uh, uh, news in the region. So Peru in February launched a roadmap for taxonomy development. So Fred also mentioned that uh, a local taxonomy can be uh, a good uh, way of setting out a pathway for investors and issuers to know what projects and assets classify as green in the region. Uh, so we've been working with a few countries here in, in Latin America as well. Uh, in April, Colombia launched its green taxonomy, and this was a process that we, we supported them with. So we want to make sure that taxonomies, which are the classifications of green, uh, of assets and projects that can be considered green, we want to make sure that all taxonomies around the world uh, are as harmonized as possible uh, so that they can continue to provide a clear guidance for both investors and issuers on what is considered uh, green. So we, we've been part, climate bonds has been part of the, the discussions around uh, the world. Uh, and, you know, if, if Jamaica is, is interested, we'd be more than happy to support, especially having launched already the, the green bond uh, paper, uh, so the guidelines. Um, in March this year, Chile launched the world first sustainability linked bond, uh, sovereign bond. Uh, so linked to, to very clear KPIs, but not uh, use of proceeds, but it did very well in the market. It had a, a, an oversubscription and uh, saw a greenium as well. And when it was launched, so it attracted a lot of investors. And in June, uh, Chile's Ministry of Finance started conversations about a green taxonomy as well. So these this is all uh, I think part of the, the, the whole uh, momentum that green GSS bonds are having. And we feel very excited and we feel like uh, there's a lot of opportunities in Latin America and the Caribbean, which I hope to bring uh, here as well. Obviously, as we all know, there are challenges uh, in the region specifically. Uh, we mentioned this as as well. So a lack of understanding around labeled bonds. Uh, we know that market education is essential to developing this, this labeled bond market. And it's just a matter of demystifying uh, what seems to be a complex subject, but really is not. Because a, a GSS bond, a labeled bond is just like a traditional or vanilla bond, but with the additional element of being green or sustainable and having very clear metrics uh, towards the use of proceeds uh, that benefit either the environment or social projects or both. Um, maturity of local capital markets, because the sustainable market growth usually follows the development of local markets, uh, it's obviously, uh, they're, they're, they're obviously linked. So the more mature a local market is, the more it will be uh, able to welcome uh, sustainable finance. But uh, really what we've been saying here in the region as well is we have an opportunity to build better from scratch. As we know, you know, Europe uh, 
is very much still trying to move away from fossil fuels. And here we have an opportunity to build from scratch and already build in a greener way. Um, obviously, local regulatory hurdles. We know that some countries have policies that prevent issuing of sovereign bonds. Brazil, for example, is one of them. Um, and sometimes there's a lack of, of incentives as well. So governments and central banks do have a, a role to play when they uh, present incentives for companies to issue GSS bonds. Uh, they can, for example, we've seen this in uh, Peru, uh, they could reduce transaction costs for new issuers or implement rules that encourage alignment to international best practices, sustainable best practices. So this is a way for them to uh, possibly incentivize uh, more issuances in the region. And concentrate, concentration of investments, when only a limited number of players are present in the local market, liquidity can be low and prevent new issuers from coming to market. So this happens also when uh, the, a, a local stock market is not yet uh, accessed by many players. So it, new issuers sometimes don't have a pathway, a clear pathway to accessing them. But um, again, all of these challenges, I think they present uh, parallel opportunities for growing the, the sustainable market. So I brought a few, I think we mentioned uh, a few of these. Um, market education. So the more we talk about GSS uh, labeled instruments, uh, the more we can inform stakeholders, the more we um, train. So for example, we have uh, strategic alliances with a few stock exchanges here in the region. Uh, and we are in discussions with the Jamaica Stock Exchange as well to do the same. So when we train uh, uh, stock exchanges staff or new issuers, we really are training multipliers to talk uh, about GSS bonds and how, how they can be issued. So we really want to have as many players as possible knowing uh, what uh, GSS bonds mean. Um, Many local markets in Latin America, Caribbean have a heavy sustainability focus already. So this is great. We know that Costa Rica, Chile uh, have a very heavy uh, focus on, you know, uh, they have ambitious NDCs. They really want to make sure that they reach net zero, a net zero economy by 2050. Uh, so this is a chance for, for us to use green bonds and sustainable bonds even more in these markets. Uh, same thing for regulations. There, uh, there's a possibility to make sure that these new regulations, when they come on, they incentivize the markets. So they can already include green bonds as a, a, a possible instrument for a, obtaining climate, climate goals. Um, a diverse market. Again, we've seen we've been seeing the diversification of uh, labeled bond instruments. Uh, so there is appetite for sustainable issuances, and there is appetite from investors uh, to to fund these initiatives. And sometimes, you know, there's a pipeline. I think uh, Fred will bring uh, uh, a way forward. So there there are sometimes pipeline projects in the pipeline for a country. And uh, what they lack sometimes is just, you know, this uh, a bit more knowledge about how to, how to make a match, how to match make uh, with investors, but they are looking at the, the region. And um, Latin America's infrastructure gaps, which are a big challenge, uh, but they are also an opportunity because they have such big investment needs in infrastructure it gives them an opportunity to build uh, better. So I wanted to bring to you as well a few, uh, a few opportunities, like make it more clear uh, for the Caribbean, for Jamaica, you know, what uh, could be some projects that could be funded via uh, greener sustainable bonds. 
Uh, so for example, uh, here in four, four different types of, of projects, of sectors, uh, renewable energy, for example, because uh, the Caribbean, uh, Central American Caribbean are so rich in renewable energy sources, solar, wind, biomass. Uh, we've been seeing a few issuances in the region already. So for example, El Salvador uh, invested in solar farms, uh, Honduras in wind farms, for example. So these are very clear and what we call pure play um, uh, sectors that are more straightforward and can be where green bonds can directly fund these types of projects. Um, low carbon, uh, so national urban passenger rail and freight rail networks, uh, BRT systems, electric vehicles, of course, so we saw recently in Costa Rica, uh, they electrified their whole greater metropolitan area and they funded this uh, through a green bond. So to install a mass rapid transit uh, system. Panama did the same for their Metro city line. Uh, Guatemala uh, also installed a new city light rail. Uh, so these are all examples of projects that can be funded via um, green bonds. Um, sustainable water management, this is a, a big one in the Caribbean specifically. So water capture, collection, storage, uh, water treatment, uh, flood and drought defense, stormwater management. Uh, so recently we saw Belize uh, fund a water treatment facility through a sustainable bond, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Nicaragua also uh, a sustainable water supply and sanitation project. So again, a sustainable bond, which funded both green and uh, social benefits for, for Nicaragua. And we also have sustainable waste management, uh, cutting down on waste production, of course, you know, making more efficient use of resources. And we saw in Dominican, the Dominican Republic, uh, they funded a recycling plant for metals, the first in the Caribbean, uh, through uh, a sustainable bond. And Costa Rica also funded a water to energy gasification plant. So these are a few uh, more specific examples of what types of projects can be funded using uh, GSS bonds. A few other uh, investment opportunities here in Central America and the Caribbean. Uh, Fred mentioned blue economy. This is, you know, a, a very, a fairly straightforward one for the Caribbean. Uh, almost 100% of the Caribbean's population lives on the coast. Biodiversity is being harmed. Uh, pollution, climate change related uh, um, phenomenon. So there is an opportunity to use blue bonds to finance these climate related projects, uh, especially if issued by governments. Um, Recently, we saw uh, the world's first sovereign blue bond. So it was issued by the Republic of Seychelles. Uh, uh, it was a $15 million private placement and it supported the expansion of uh, marine protected areas. So it improved also the governance of fisheries and the development of uh, the Seychelles blue economy. Uh, so this was a first, a world first. Um, we also saw one in January 2021 where from the Nordic Investment Bank. It issued the first blue bond in January 2021, uh, targeting sustainable investors and supporting water projects around the Baltic Sea. Uh, so again, eligible projects within the blue economy uh, can include wastewater treatment, water pollution prevention, uh, and water-related adaptation. So these are a few uh, examples of how to use uh, bonds, uh, labeled bonds to, to fund climate-related projects. On resilience, resilience is a big one, uh, I think specifically for the Caribbean. Uh, climate change is going to, as we all know, escalate the frequency of, and severity of natural uh, hazards. So building resilient infrastructure is critical, especially uh, here. And uh, our taxonomy, the climate bonds taxonomy also brings an element of resilient projects 
that can be considered green. So uh, I will leave it in the chat box, chat box right after I'm done, but uh, the climate bonds led a paper on how to scale up green bonds for climate resilience projects. So there's a really a, a roadmap to how uh, we can scale up resilient projects here in the region. And uh, we also, uh, there's another one for issuers specifically. So if you're a company, you're thinking of issuing uh, a bond to fund resilient uh, infrastructure, I will share all of this with you in the chat box. I think it can be a very useful uh, pathway to, um, to support issuers in the region. And agriculture. So we've, we've been seeing a lot of uh, land use uh, bonds here, uh, especially in Brazil. Uh, but Caribbean agriculture employs so between 20 and 30% of the region's workforce. Uh, and GSS bonds can be a powerful mechanism to fund sustainable agricult agriculture. Uh, so what we really want uh, with these projects is to continue to make sure that, the, that they are funding and financing uh, net zero uh, projects or uh, a transition towards a low carbon economy. And I promised you yesterday, and I'm going to uh, talk you a little bit through uh, transition, which is a new area that the Climate Bonds Initiative and obviously other institutions around the world are looking at. Uh, because when we started talking about uh, labeled bonds and green bonds was the first, uh, were the first instrument to, to come about, uh, and they continue to be the largest share, at least here in, in Latin America, of the labeled uh, bond issuance. Um, but we also need to look at hard to abate sectors. So how do we look at the brown sectors of the economy and make sure that they are transitioning towards a, a green um, uh, industry, right? So we've been looking at uh, transport building and industry, energy, uh, information technology, land use, and also uh, the climate bonds has been developing new criteria, transition criteria, which we've been calling for areas such as cement industry, steel and basic chemicals to make sure that all of them are uh, making this shift to a more neutral uh, carbon neutral economy because we're going to need all of these sectors, right? Uh, in uh, possibly by next year, we will start looking as well at even more difficult sectors such as mining and oil and gas, because we also need to make sure that they're transitioning. And as you can see here, there's a five to $7 trillion a year uh, opportunity to fund these types of project in transition. Um, and when we started to talk about transitions, we established in our white paper on financing credible transitions, we established five pillars of what a credible transition must have to, to be ambitious enough and to make sure that we can, we can consider it uh, as a fair transition. So it needs to be in line with the Paris Agreement trajectory, so the 1.5 degree trajectory trajectory. Uh, it needs to be science-based, just like our taxonomy. So all the criteria that we establish for all the economic sectors always need to be uh, science-based. Um, so we usually do, we invite panels of experts, scientists, and also industry experts to discuss in a very uh, uh, scientific manner how each sector can uh, start reducing their greenhouse gas emissions, for example. Um, offsets don't count in our transition pathway, so a credible transition don't count uh, carbon offsets, but should count upstream uh, scope three emissions. Um, technological viability trumps economic competitiveness. And we also say all the time, action, not pledges. So we you know, uh, 
we want to see things happening and not just a pledge to be green by a certain year. So a credible transition will definitely establish a very ambitious pathway for a company, for example, or a country to achieve its climate goals. Um, so this is the step-by-step, -step, you know, also set for the transition finance for transforming companies paper. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, goals aligned to the Paris Agreement, robust plans, having a clear implementation plan, and internal monitoring. We, we always discuss the, the importance of uh, monitoring at every step of the way to make sure that the resources are being correctly allocated, and external reports so that you know, the company, the entity itself is not uh, vouching for itself when it says that it's transitioning. So all these papers are available on our website. They are, uh, these resources are all free. So please feel free to download them if you're interested uh, to learn more about transition. And just the last few points from me uh, on market trends for Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, I think we've been seeing an increase in sustainability linked bonds. These are the bonds that don't have uh, their, which resources uh, are not linked to the use of proceeds, but rather by KPIs. So they establish uh, a certain goal that they want to achieve through the funding, um, through the, the SLB. Uh, so for example, uh, Chile, when it issued its sovereign SLB, it linked uh, its KPIs to the country's climatic goals. So this was a this was why it was so innovative and a, a world first really here in the region uh, is that we can use these labeled bonds to achieve our climate goals. Uh, so this is what we want to see more and more of. Uh, we've seen by last year, so this data is a bit uh, a bit old. Uh, but $10 billion already in SLBs in the first quarter of 2021 with Brazil, Mexico, and Chile leading, leading the way. So this, this has leaped already um, uh, exponentially uh, this year, especially. And we had big, big issuers in Suzano, FEMSA, uh, which is the Coca-Cola um, uh, owner here uh, in Latin America. And uh, we've been seeing some transition bonds as well. So there's a growing interest in the region to look at these hard to abate sectors and make sure that they're transitioning. So how do we uh, help them issue uh, bonds to fund this transition? And we also touched, I think, on taxonomy development. So there are currently four countries developing green taxonomies here in the region. Uh, Colombia just launched uh, its taxonomy, but we're all, we know that Chile, uh, the, Repu the Dominican Republic, and Peru also has a pathway to, to developing its green taxonomy. And we're all looking at how uh, best practices can be implemented across the region in a uniform uh, uh, way so that investors and issuers know what to look for when they're uh, issuing labeled bonds. And some global market trends, uh, green trade finance, we've been discussing with a few stakeholders now, how do we establish standards and definitions of what's green and sustainable in foreign trade and international trade? So how do we make sure that uh, importing and exporting services are uh, being as sustainable as possible. So this is one of the, the global trends that we've been seeing. Um, NDC reviews, we saw a few countries uh, shifting their ambition. So being more ambitious and setting uh, goals for, for their nationally determined contributions. Uh, there are some countries who, which have still to, to step up, but uh, I think the, the war in Ukraine show you know how how this dependency on fossil fuels is un not sustainable so we really need to move away from uh from fossil fuels 
And I think most of you will have seen the IPCC report, you know, indicating how urgent it is to act. And this goes hand in hand with uh, the market awareness and society demands. So consumers are more and more aware. Uh, and so if, an, if individuals are aware, you'll know that investors are ever more aware and they will be requiring uh, tighter, uh, not regulations, but tighter uh, um, rules around uh, and transparency, definitely, around the issuance of these uh, instruments and how they can definitely support, uh, whether it is a company, whether it's a country, in its uh, road to uh, a net zero economy, which uh, is what we would need to get at. Um, so thank you. This is it from me today, but I'll be available here to answer a few questions. I think you're thank, there. You yes. Go. Thank you, Marina. Marina Barkey. Um, you know, sometimes, you, you, you know, they, they tell you experience really teaches wisdom and uh, you are everything that, that the bio has said that we would get in a presentation. Wonderful presentation. Um, we certainly are much better for it, having listened and, you know, we, we, we understood it was clear, it was informative. Really an excellent presentation and the ease that you, you, you put across the information in, in a way that many can understand. So we want to thank you and as, as is the norm, we're going to open to questions, but just before we go to the questions, I just want to highlight, um, of course, that I think Taj had, had, had posted in the chat um, that the presentations would be available afterwards and and that's something that we want to thank you for Taj. um wonderful i mean it's always good to have those presentations um as tanika chan says it will be useful to have access to the presentation at a later date so that persons can process new information at a gradual pace and and, and i really want to say that is absolutely true and e jones says demystifying is a key operative term, Marina. We fully agree. Of course, um, thank you for the presentation again. And uh, Marina says, as promised, here's the link. And so she has put the link in the chat as she had indicated that she would um, during the presentation. So we're gonna go to the questions. Um, Certainly, Camille's hand is already up. And so, Camille, we're going to invite you to just show the question. Yes. So, first of all, let me join in the thank yous to Marina, both for yesterday and today. And this question is not so much to her as to perhaps the JSE or those who may know. Where is Jamaica in the process of setting some? targets, the net zero targets? Do we know where we are? And then the question to Marina would be, as a nation, what would be our initial steps, if you can guide us? And thank you for the material that you're sharing so that we can go and inform ourselves. But those would be my questions. Thank you, Camille. Um, I will, uh, I know that Jamaica recently set some fairly ambitious targets uh, for reducing its greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. I, um, I was just opening here, I think by 60%. So it's enhanced its NDCs, which is what we really want to see. Uh, and I'll say, for example, in Brazil, it's, it wasn't the case recently. We saw a shift in the NDCs, but not to the level of ambition that we, we wanted to see. And um, I think that recently also, uh, very recently Jamaica, the Jamaican government launched its green bond uh, roadmap. So these are the types of initiatives that we really want to see uh, because at, at the end of the day, it's such a new market 
uh, and just having uh, the, the first guidelines coming up, uh, roadmaps coming out. This webinar is a great example of, you know, how the Jamaica Stock Exchange is already taking responsibility and leading the way and leading the conversation around green bonds, sustainable bonds, and really everything ESG related. Uh, because at the end of the day, the countries will have to, to adapt. Um, and I mean, Jamaica, I think, is starting off, but starting off on the right foot, I'd say. Thank you, Marina. I um, hope that answers your question. Camille? Um, and, and, go ahead. Yes, it, it, it does. It does. And so my next question would then be to the JSC in terms of guidelines. And clearly, you have put, taken us off on a good start. But the guidelines for our listed companies, is there thinking about that? Um, never. Well, all right. Um, so you, you, you've taken the, the JC a little by surprise with that question. But as you can see, we certainly are um, already on the way in terms of the initiatives. And like many other things, um, the JC has really been leading the way in charting the course of change and progress um, in the Jamaican economy, not just in the financial sector, but the, in the economy as a whole. I mean, when you look at a, a workshop like this, it tells you that we're in the right direction. And certainly um, we're gonna get more direct answer to your question later on. Um, but but I think the JC is really, pushing um in, in I completely direction. I completely agree and do congratulate the JSC. I completely agree. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Um thank you again Marina. Any other question for Marina? I have a question in the QA section, Mr. Rose. Mm -hmm. Um if I could if I could just say what it is. I I was asking whether um, whether you're seeing, and, and here I'm talking about Climate Bonds Initiative, Marina, uh, and, and you refer to the appetite for issuance. Are you seeing a growing appetite in the, in the corporate sector for issuance? You, you gave us some, some good encouraging cases from across LAC and infrastructure and so on, but are you seeing generally a, a kind of growing appetite for these public-private partnerships where Governments are issuing bonds, um, and and the take up. I, I don't know if if that's a clear question, but um, I'm just wondering. I know it's growing in some places. I wonder what we have seen in the Caribbean. Uh, probably very early days for the Caribbean, but um, we we want to see how we can transfer, bridge some of these best practices from elsewhere. And I'm I'm just wondering what your perspective might be. No, it's a very clear question, and you're right in saying that there's been an appetite. So, for example, uh, in Brazil, the leading uh, type of institution that issues green bonds is are the non non financial corporates. So, definitely, uh, we've been seeing there. There's a lot of appetite. We see a lot of uh, companies using our forestry criteria, our agriculture criteria are a solar wind criteria to issue bonds and finance or refinance uh, projects uh, that they want to uh, you know, build on uh, sustainability. Uh, about PPPs, we, I think we wanted to see more of these uh, happening because there's such a great opportunity uh, for, for funding, you know, uh, issuing green bonds, sustainable bonds, and we haven't seen uh, enough of these. Uh, and I, I, I'm speaking more from experience. I'm sorry, my experience is more based in Brazil, but here in Brazil, there would be such a, a huge uh, opportunity to fund infrastructure needs through PPPs and using green and sustainable bonds to do that would be fantastic, but we haven't been seeing enough uh, I do have another great paper that I'm going to share with you here in the chat. 
that we also mapped uh, the green infrastructure opportunities for Central America and the Caribbean. So you can see, you know, what range of projects could be funded by these. Uh, but yeah, I, I would personally love to see more uh, public partner, uh, private partnerships happening in this, uh, in this area. Absolutely agree with you, Marina. Vindel Kerr, Kerr has a question. Vindel? Thank you, Mr. Rose. And my, my, my response is really a statement supporting the excellent question asked by Camille. And my statement goes, proactivity in leadership is key to reducing downside risk for those you serve. Okay? Thank you. And, 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 and I could almost say, Vindel, I'm sure you're talking about the people at the stock exchange who have certainly been proactive in, in leading the way in this, in this particular case. Eh? Um, but you're correct. You're correct. You're absolutely correct in, in, in what you've said. And again, um, Marina has been spot on um, in terms of her answers to the questions. And we've seen um, a number of things being posted in the chat here um where we can get some of the some in additional information ava is saying to us check documents at pioj and she's pointing us to where we can find some of the information um carolyn hale was asking will jc provide capacity building for those companies preparing to issue ipos and i suppose you're talking about i suppose you're talking about ipos in terms of the the green um, economy, because certainly the, the, the stock exchange has been providing um, capacity building and even more than just capacity building for um, new companies looking to list. As a matter of fact, I think the JSC has done everything to, to, to hold the hands of, of new companies, um, incubator, if you may, to ensure that some of these companies come to market. So do expect much more of the same and even improved um, meant in, 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 in that kind of area. Um, Christopher said Jamaica's recently adopted the ISO 37,000 governance for organizations and are also active participants in the ISO strategic advisory group on ESG. It is hoped that the resulting standard would help listed and non-listed more widely adopt good practices for performance, assurance, reporting, and disclosure, and comply with and exceed the TCFD, the IFRS, the GRI, ISSB, and other <laughs> requirements. Certainly, and I do agree with that. Um, Denise West said GIFs had a similar seminar to this last year, and so we're, we're, we're really on the right track. As respond as as promised, and boy, Maria is Marina is really on the ball. As promised, she has posted the information again. Taj is saying um, the JC will most definitely provide support to all actors in the market. There you go. So the JC is also on the ball, saying yes, we will provide um, the kind of holding hand approach that they've always done. So um, it's been a wonderful. Um, question and answer in this section. And it's followed up on a wonderful presentation from Marina Barkey. As I tell you, I was very excited when I looked at the bio and I saw what was going to be presented and she did not disappoint. So let us again thank Marina, Marina Barkey for that wonderful, that excellent presentation. And again, we are so much brighter for having been here and listened to that presentation. Thank you so much. It's lovely to have an engaged audience like this as well. Thank you for having me. Great. Of course, um, moving on, the way forward. The GB Roadmap presentation, gaps and the ways forward, proposed roadmap and actions to boost GSSS bonds, market in the Caribbean, ESG and the Jamaica Stock Exchange. And 
for this, we're gonna be bringing back um, Frederico, but we also um, in this presentation are gonna have um, none other than Miss Nora Blake, who is gonna be helping us with that presentation. Now, let me just give you a little bit of information um, as to who this wonderful presenter is. I tell you, Jamaica has some real stars um, on this little rock. Nora is a local pioneer in the area of social entrepreneurship with extensive technical knowledge in micro and small business facilitation at the community level. In 2018, Nora was appointed manager of the Jamaica Stock Exchange newest subsidiary, the Jamaica Social Exchange. The JSSE is a social sector developmental initiative seeking to ultimately grow GDP through social business, social enterprises via the operation of trading platform for SEs at the JC. From 2012 to 2016, Nora, was, Nora served as an advisor to the Minister of Industry, Investment and Commerce and was integral to the team at the ministry, which developed the first draft of the MSME and entrepreneurship policy, which was tabled in Parliament. She's a community builder and a social entrepreneur. So some of Nora's other achievements include, she's appointed a justice of the peace for the parish of St. Andrew in 2013, chairperson for the Rosetown Lamp project which really provided land titles for residents and all oh, that's needed in Jamaica. Facilitator for numerous micro business operated by inner city residents. A charter member and past president of the Optimist Club of Trenchtown. Chairperson of the advisory board for Jamin Tours, agency for inner city renewal facilitated the development of community tourism product for Trenchtown, positioning it as the birthplace of reggae music. The overall intent being to establish Trenchtown as a cultural village. This led to Jamin entering into an MOU with Sandals Island Roots brand for their guests to visit Trenchtown as a major off-property attraction. She was founder of a not-for-profit Pickney Friends, which provides bursaries and funds for school attendance, facilitates summer school and various treats during the year for children in Rosetown, Trenchtown, Whitfield Town, Maxfield Avenue since 2002. Coordinates sponsorship from the EU to facilitate children from the inner city participating in the annual Food for the Poor and CB UE5K races since 2013. Convener of the No Nine Day Wonder advocacy movement against gender based violence. You know, with that, she must have gotten some awards and ultimately received the Prime Minister's Award, Medal of Appreciation in 2013, Jamaica 50 Medal of Appreciation. She also received the NCB Nation Builder Award in the individual category in 2011. No, you know, that's, that's just so wonderful. I was looking at the bio to see if they were saying there are more than one person because um, I don't know that any one person could have done all of that. But with all of that said, let's just sit back and get ready for another exciting session. Um, and we bring back Fred Seifert and Nora to lead us into this session. So over to you guys. Thanks a lot. Um, I don't know who should go first. Uh, maybe I could, um, I have just a few slides. I don't know, uh, just a, a few minutes. Uh, talk about the way forward, and I believe that uh, the next part would be how JSE is already working on that. So maybe it's the. Uh, you go first. 
Yeah, yeah, the order order that could work uh, well. So I'll just uh, share my screen for a second here. Um, okay, so uh, as I mentioned, I have just uh, a few slides. Uh, based on what I presented on uh, the previous session before uh, Marina, uh, we have seen uh, different situations in each one of the countries, but we have seen some um, issues that are uh, applicable to all of the countries. And with that, we have established some ways forward uh, for the region uh, as a whole, of course, each country could work specifically on those subjects and define uh, more specific actions uh, that could be taken. Uh, but um, it's good to have this general idea on what could be done to unlock uh, the GSSS uh, bond market's potential in the Caribbean. So one thing is uh, to improve the knowledge on environmental social issues. Uh, I believe uh, a lot of what I'm going to mention just complement uh, what Marina just presented uh, in the last session. So knowledge on ENS issues in general, so um, uh, capacity building on understanding the importance of environmental social issues to projects, financial institutions, uh, the impact on profitability, uh, the importance of green bonds to have more funding uh, to promote sustainable projects, the development of taxonomies, frameworks, and etc. cetera. Uh, incorporation to business strategy. On one hand, it's important to really leverage knowledge, uh, but uh, on the other hand, it's key to put in practice all of this knowledge that has been raised, right? So we are uh, at the initial, initial state in the financial sector of the different countries in the region to really develop policies and practices uh, uh, related to environmental and social issues. So it's important to uh, promote organ capacity building, but uh, from the part of the financial institutions to develop uh, these policies and practices based on international references, based on what their peers are working with, and of course, all the knowledge that has been shared on that capacity building. Um, the knowledge should be uh, brought uh, and should be shared not only with financial institutions but also with the civil society for them um, as i mentioned uh, in a question uh, raised by the audience in my first session uh, that the civil society ngos and other actors have this key um, roles in pressuring the markets regulators and other actors to incorporate ENS issues. To do so, of course, they have to understand uh, in, in indeed um, how these ENS issues affect different actors. Uh, they could generate more information. They could help on investigation and research and etc. So it's important this knowledge be um, uh, shared and be raised by the civil society as well. Um, with all of that, we can go to the second tier um, of, uh, uh, of aspects of uh, ways forward, such as promoting new types of investments, uh, new financial products, green bonds, because uh, the understanding of the importance of such instruments uh, will be already there. The regulatory framework could advance because regulators would understand the situation of each country and how they could advance uh, to demand more uh, and to provide these incentives and signals to the market, uh, uh, signals to the market to really uh, uh, promote the ENS agenda. And of course, um, we are facing a, a, a challenge where uh, post uh, pandemic, of course, we are still suffering from the impacts of COVID uh, but let's say we are finalizing uh, finally uh, this crisis, but the impacts are um, long lasting, uh, of course. Uh, so in recovering from this crisis would be uh, great to incorporate environmental social issues. One, to minimize the impacts of the crisis, the, of course have taken a toll um, a lot on more vulnerable populations, 
uh, the uh, 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 the beginning once again of economic activities at full speed may take a toll on the environment as well. So to minimize those impacts and to avoid new crisis, it would be important to minimize those issues. And of course, financial issues are also uh, related to the press, such as low liquidity, which affect, of course, the capacity of generating new projects. So uh, general opportunities for all countries, uh, strengthening capacities at all sector levels, uh, exchange experiences. So we have experience from Barbados uh, in issuance of green bonds. We have experiences in each country at different levels, participating in participation in sectoral initiatives from Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, we have seen countries developing guidelines um, um, before developing regulations, not only in the Caribbean, but Latin America it has a lot to offer uh, in terms of these experiences uh, that could be shared. And they are more uh, in line with uh, the necessities and the capacities of uh, the Caribbean than experiences from uh, markets such as Europe, the United States, and etc. Implementation of innovative technologies to mitigate uh, impact of climate change, but also to be prepared to adapt to its impacts. Um, design gradual action plans to foster these uh, technologies via different uh, um, um, green financial products, issuance of green bonds. Uh, the green bonds are not uh, the only way of levering resources uh, for these technologies and other initiatives, commit, uh, national commitments, and etc. So working with uh, multilateral, uh, bilateral source of financing, technical assistance, could help uh, to develop the green board market per se, but also uh, sustainable finance markets as a whole. Establish frameworks, a set of ground rules that, that should be respected by different parties uh, and could be improved um, time by time to really uh, understand the spirit of time uh, and incorporate uh, in the increasing demands that we need to fulfill to uh, a low carbon, uh, uh, to the transition to a low carbon economy. And with that, uh, we could also see the development of innovative technology, innovative industry, new sectors, such as uh, green hydrogen, just an example, but we can see more and more uh, technologies be developed with these markets, more uh, this, the, the sustainable, uh, with a sustainable financial market, more developed, we can see uh advancing from identifying opportunities creating capacity to really seizing the opportunities there uh, there are so uh let's say that the actions uh in the short term would be more strengthening the sector capacities uh promoting dialogues workshops with sector associations developing esg guides um for the real economy for the financial sector the financial sector should get involved with uh, real economy sector association, civil society, national government to really develop products uh, uh, and services in line with the country's climate goals, with what uh, the sectors are in need um, uh, as well. Uh, they should be, the financial sector should be integrating yes to risk and climate risk assessment to their investment decisions. So. They, uh, they could advance on that, but the regulators should also be um, aware that of that need uh, and what they could provide in terms of, um, uh, of rules, uh, norms to help push uh, this agenda. Uh, a work table um, of green financing, not only focused on uh, risks, but also focusing on opportunities could be uh, an interesting way to keep uh, this, uh, this agenda going. This could be to the development, um, not only of regulations, but um, to the development of regulations, ways of fulfilling this regulation and ways of developing new opportunities, such as the development of taxonomy that could help uh, uh, issuance of green bonds, uh, creation of green financial products. And finally, 
regulators uh, should provide incentives, uh, financial and non-financial ones, uh, to promote green bonds, green credit lines, and with that, the development of a pipeline of uh, potential projects would be uh, easier to achieve. So uh, since we have GAC uh, uh, also speaking, I'll uh, just uh, let you have my email if you have any questions uh, in addition to the ones that we'll be able to answer during this uh, session. Uh, feel free to contact me and I give the floor uh, to JSC. And I'll be here to uh, any particular question. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Fred. Um, Nora, uh, you're gonna come on. So we're gonna take any questions you have for for Fred at the at the end. Um, so we just invite you now, Nora. And as I said, I, I have a look now to see if it's more than one of you with all those <laughs> things that you've been doing. But welcome. <laughs> Thank you. You're so kind, <laughs> gracious. Mm. Any? Are you ready for for us? Are there any questions? Feel free. Should I proceed? Yes, certainly. Okay, thank you. Good day, everyone, and thank you for joining us um, for the Jamaica Social Stock Exchange presentation on this um, workshop. The Jamaica Social Stock Exchange has a tagline, I would like to start there, which is sustainable growth through partnership. We are fully aware that we're not able to actualize the vision on our own because it's a big vision. And plus we know as a principle that is embedded in the sustainable development goals, that it is together through partnership that we can achieve so much more. This is actually a social initiative of the Jamaica Stock Exchange. Um, who are we? In 2019, the Jamaica Stock Exchange launched the Jamaica Social Stock Exchange, extending its corporate social responsibility activity to a national agenda level with a commitment to promote the mobilization of social capital markets on this social stock exchange. This initiative is intended to assist Jamaica in achieving UN 17 Sustainable Development Goals. The 17 goals are an urgent call for action by all countries who have signed on, developed and developing to get into a global partnership. It is in realizing that to end poverty and other deprivations um, we have to hand in hand have strategies that will improve health and education, reduce inequality to spur economic growth. Um, there are five pillars for sustainable development, which are called the five Ps, people, prosperity, peace, partnership, and planet. The JSSE, we have chosen to focus on three Ps, that of people, so we speak to our corporate entities now of not just having the bottom line for prosperity, which is our second P, but people as well, and that of partnership. Yeah, so our three P's that we focus on are people, prosperity, and partnership. The JSSD way for a better Jamaica is um, explained or described through our vision and our mission. Our mission is to provide that, let me give you our mission, our vision first. It is to establish sustainability in the social sector through the social sector organizations ecosystem where we seek to assist in focusing, by focusing on strengthening socioeconomic, cultural, environmental, and economic development. Hence, our presence in an SEG forum. Our heavy emphasis is on the social. Our mission is to provide that platform of transparency and accountability for Jamaica's social sector, through which 
socially responsible investors can now invest with a greater confidence in the social sector, the social economy, to see an increased impact of this economy on the overall economy. When we look on, what we realize is that there are many organizations in Jamaica that are doing crucial social work to improve the quality of lives of our citizens, those that are in vulnerable communities and live under vulnerable conditions. However, we see the organizations struggle to gain consistent and adequate financial support towards this goal of sustainability. So the Jamaica, Social, the Jamaica Stock Exchange has come up with a solution. The solution is the Jamaica Social Stock Exchange where we are enabling social sector entities to attract funding so that they might become more sustainable. This lovely photo that you're all viewing, looking at uh, Minister Grange, Minister Green, our chairman, Neville Ying, and the two persons to the left are the founders of Defcan Coffee. They were our first listed company. So back to the solution, the solution is detailed in our strategic objectives and our value proposition. Our strategic objectives speak to providing a self-sustaining platform. That is us here at the JSSE to be self-sustaining ourselves, right? For the long-term growth and development of the social sector through the establishment of two markets to increase the social impact of the work that is done in the social sector. We also have as an objective to facilitate the development of the ecosystem that brings all the stakeholders together because we are seeking to facilitate a balanced economic and social development of the nation. This is gonna be reflected, these are reflected in our value propositions. We have four value propositions. Firstly, we have a proposition for the nation that the JSSC as a tool for inclusive development can assist Jamaica to achieve that holistic balance between economic and social development. In fact, it's our desire, our wish, our dream to be the best in class for the development of a country where the economy and the social um, human factor are in balance. And just like the JSE, our small little JSE was able to be um, selected as the number one top performing stock exchange 2015, 2018. We believe that the Jamaica Social Stock Exchange's effort can bring Jamaica as a nation to this place of balance um, development. In terms of the corporate social responsibility activities, this is another value proposition of our companies, our corporate entities, we provide a unique opportunity for them to maximize the value and the impact of this corporate social responsibility. So we can add value to what is currently being done. Also, our Jamaicans who reside in the diaspora and foundations and so on, we are providing an opportunity to increase the impact of their social contributions. For example, in our diaspora, we have traditionally had a very um, large gap to fill in terms of trust. So the transparency and accountability, the reporting, the measuring of the impact that um, results from the effort from the monies that are sent is an area that we are able to definitely add value to what comes in from our diaspora and Jamaicans abroad. And also the multinational international development institutions that do lend support to Jamaica's development we also seek to facilitate a greater level of impact from that and we facilitate collaboration. I could just point out that um, the IDB has currently um, a project that they are funding for the JSSE, which is the project um, Innovating Social Sector Financing to help us to do what it is that we are hoping to do. 
our successes since 2019, since we were launched, has seen us raise uh, approximately 26.5 million for two projects that were fully funded, are fully funded, that were on the platform of the initial five. We have raised an additional over $20 million for a number of projects, including some that were responses that we made for the need in the um, health sector, as well as a need in the um, for a faith-based entity teen challenge that needed support for their small business. We have also reached out and helped in the case of regionally for St. Vincent and the Grenadines when we had the eruption of the La Soufère. And so we not only have our selected projects that we have funded, but we have others that have represented intense need. And in particular, in the pandemic, we have been able to make contributions um, through donations that we have raised from the market. We still have a number of projects of the initial five that we selected when the market was when the market was launched. And I'm just gonna tell you quickly about those. We have three projects still in need of funding. So they're on the platform being supplied to make a demand on the market. This project, the Shalom project from Choose Life International, it will empower um, a network of Choose Life ambassadors to provide intervention at the community level through your churches, your schools and community groups to help counter a lot of the social disorder that we see. They have five pillars of training, suicide prevention, which is their flagship program, the art and science of happiness, which they're currently introducing in schools through the help of the Jamaican diaspora group um, of the um, Union of Alumni Association, stress management, conflict resolution, trauma intervention, and basic counseling skills. This project has um, a need for $10 million Jamaican for us to be fully funded. We also have a project called STOP the violence, which is a project that um, is, is executed by Spring Praise Jamaica, a faith-based initiative that seeks to transform the lives of our children by addressing character building through values and attitudes that would be taught, as well as interestingly in this program, as the JSE actually sponsors this program as well, we, they will be trained in financial literacy. This program, this project has a shortfall of 17 million Jamaican dollars. We have in Trenchtown, the Jamin, which is the Jamaica Music Institute Entrepreneurship Project, which is um, an awesome project for community transformation, community renewal, by providing the at-risk youth and young adults an alternative pathway to earn their livelihood as they seek to leverage that rich musical legacy and the power of the Trenchtown brand um, to assist these persons to be innovative, entrepreneurial, as they upskill them through the, what they provide at the project, in, which is anchored and based in the studio. The project has a shortfall of $6 million Jamaican. Now, all the projects that are on the Jamaica Social Stock Exchange are thoroughly vetted. And then there's a selection process which happens at the board level. And it is when the selection is done at the board level that we introduce the projects to the market for funding. When we have obtained a minimum of 80% of the target of the funding that's required, then they're listed on the JSSE through a framework that mirrors exactly how the JSC works. Um, you have the bell ringing ceremony, which officially lists the project. And then we get into the regulation where the accountability and the transparency is delivered to the investing public. Um, I hope that what I've shared with you so far will help you to believe that together we can all achieve so much more and to see that the JSSE, JSE has 
in place a significant initiative that can help us in our sustainability reporting for our SEG. We have a strong initiative here that will facilitate corporate Jamaica to be able to have a strong social reporting component. Mm -hmm. Contributions and partnership are welcome and we can be contacted, of course, at the office, which is 967-3271 here in Jamaica. And um, we are on mobile, 322-4505. You can reach out anytime. And also online, our website is www.jsseja.com. We can be reached on via email as well, jsse at Jamstock EX. And we're on social media, JSS Exchange. So um, I thank you for your time. And I look forward to any questions, any queries you may share in the chat, or you can reach us via any one of these methods that are listed here for to facilitate communication. Thank you. Thank you, Nora. That was wonderful, wonderful presentation. Um, thank you also, Fred, um, yeah. for your presentation. As we look at the way forward, and uh, um, as we as we await questions from the audience, um, the participants, let me just remind you. You know, as we're looking at a way forward, I remember when was it about two thousand and nine when the Jamaica Stock Exchange pioneered um, the junior market locally. And we see where that has brought us today. And as we talk, talk about green energy and green bonds and the green economy, and we look at the innovation that is the Jamaica Social Stock Exchange and what it can do for our GDP and our growth and our nation as a whole, um, the way forward does look bright. So, um, any 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 questions from from the audience um, for either Fred or Nora? Questions, comments? I see two hands up. I don't know if they were up before. Camille, Facey, and Vindel Carr. I think there were questions previous in the previous questions in the okay. in questions in the previous section. Okay. Camille. Camille. <laughs> yes, my apologies. That's a legacy hand. <laughs> but since I'm on, I really want to thank the JSC for these two mornings of learning. Yes. Indeed. Indeed. You're welcome on behalf of the JSC. <laughs> but but again, um if if I might put a question in there though, Nora. So sure. given, given Jamaica's economy, um, given our different social issues, yes. um, you, you definitely see the, the Jamaica Social Ex Stock Exchange as a, a, an excellent platform for the way forward. Um, tell me, where, where do you see this in, in the next five years? Oh, all right. Basically, um, I believe we're going to be the um, one stop shop for the social sector because the vision or the mission involves us operating in two markets. We're currently operating in market one, which is like um, a type of crowdfunding platform that facilitates what most of us know of in the social sector, which are your not-for-profits, which are the one, which is where, which is, which is why you have such a struggle for sustainability, eh? because there is no guaranteed sustainable um, funds that you can rely on. And so they struggle, they flounder with all that good work that they do. But one of the things that you will find is that there is probably, when you look behind the veil, is that they struggle because they lack capacity. The governance is not in place which is something that we're bringing to the sector in a big way, which is why we're modeled off the Jamaica Stock Exchange. The same 
methods of doing business. It's the same methods that we must apply to how we operate in the social sector. So we're scaling up, yeah? So you're talking about governance. You're talking about also, oftentimes there's a need for capacity to be able to deliver. Um, they would like to be able to have a answer for particular social needs, environmental needs, but the capacity to manage is lacking. That's another thing that we bring to the space through the Jamaica Social Stock Exchange. And the Social Stock Exchange is actually a place that we're facilitating all the stakeholders. A major problem we have in Jamaica in the social sector is that we operate in silos. And so you don't have the value of synergy. Hence the tagline for us of partnership. If you're going to see social growth, there's going to be a lot of emphasis on partnership. So that's just basic stuff that we're bringing to the space. As we see in five years, 30 years time, you're going to see a big change. Secondly, we are in all that we do, we're seeking to upscale from not-for-profit to social enterprises, which is businesses, social businesses. You're driven by your social mission, but you're operating in a way that you generate surplus. I could just use quickly as a good example of a DEFCAN project. DEFCAN is a project that is a not-for-profit project that sought to or they operate strictly for the deaf community. You had young men in particular who had, you know, the problem that we have with people who have suffer from um, issues of um, debilitation, whether you're blind, whether you're deaf, whatever, self-esteem problem, lack of opportunities. There are not enough work opportunities. Deaf Can has trained a cadre of deaf young people who are now the top top barristers in delivering coffee service in Jamaica. So much so that they're able now to provide this service to entities anywhere in Jamaica and all over Jamaica. They themselves have expanded and they're able to generate a significant surplus. They have grown the business. Now a social, a social not-for-profit entity such as that could easily, when our second market is open, as soon as the legislation allow us, now list on the second market and offer to the public the opportunity to invest in a social business. So I hope you're seeing the, what, all that we have in place that could bring growth and sustainability through that one example of entities in the social sector. So what we are doing is quite innovative that can bring growth and we're on the trajectory for growth of the social sector. Very, very excellent response. And that I'm really excited by that. Um, I see Ms. E. Jones saying, she, I share the sentiments expressed by Camille. Thank you, JC, for enlightening mornings. Listen, um, you know, at, Jamaica has two major issues. One is, is the informality. And, and, and that's, that's, that's just us as a, as a people and, and, and even in the business sector. And yeah. that really has spilled over into the social sector where we've never really been formal. And, right. and, you know, so inclusion many, is one of our core values. Indeed, indeed. Yes. You know, we, we've seen the communities trying to act and, you know, community persons try to to, to get some of the social issues addressed. And, and, and we've heard, for example, that there are funds available, as you said, through EU, through the different embassies and so on. And so by formalizing and by building out this platform, mm -hmm. I am sure that, you know, this is going to be a, a major plank, a major platform for growth. And, and, and I hear you giving us a hint at the second market. So, yes. you know, I'm, I'm so excited. Um, How are we? Thank you. Yes, and I see Fred saying their participants, panelists, JC, um, C Initiative, Government of Dominica. Thanks a lot for putting in place this fantastic event. It was great to participate and I hope you have new opportunities. I hope to have new opportunities to be with you soon. So, I mean, it, it's, it, it's been two wonderful days, two wonderful days of presenting 
excellent information of identifying great opportunities, um, just enlightening the, the, the kind of things that are out there, the places that we can go and we will go. Um, and I just want to thank you all for participating. It's really been two wonderful days of this workshop and the participants, the panelists have been excellent. Um, I see Taj is saying there are a few, there are a few Q and A questions. Yes. So let us see um, who else has a question. Any other questions? What is the criteria for projects to be listed on the JSSE? I could take that. Um, for a project to be listed on our um, JSSE first market, the project has to be proposed to the JSSE from a registered um, social sector organization, meaning um, the project itself is what is proposed and the social sector organization has to be a well-established one. And in that, it would have need to submit to us three years of financial audited statements, audited financial statements, along with a number of other small items, details on directors and so on. Of course, there has to be um, a business plan for the project and a comprehensive outlay of what is intended, what is the impact, what is the outcome, what are the results that are expected, and how you would monitor and evaluate your project as you go along. The capacity to manage the project in terms of the personnel also needs to be, you know, explained and be, be, be there in the project proposal. So the most important thing criteria I would say though, is that we do require proof of the ability to manage funds well. So like financial audited statements are very important, yeah? Um, what is the impact reporting strategy or method used by JSSE? How does the impact reporting strategy work? Okay, so basically we have a system in place where we have as a partnership, we have a technical partner that actually monitors the projects for us on a month to month basis. So the technical partner does a report monthly so we're constantly overseeing the project um, on a quarterly basis. Financials have to be submitted and these are uploaded, you know, when they're accepted, being acceptable are uploaded to the website. So there is a transparency and the accountability that we speak of. We're currently in the process of finalizing the impact measurement tools that we will use to be able to report as a statistic, what is that social return that we're getting on your investment? So I'm not able at this time to give you that reporting, but it is in the process that we're um, building out for our own capacity. Yes. And there is one more. How are the youth projects or issues of intergenerational equity incorporated into the JSSE focus? youth projects well basically we do as i said we have adopted the 17 sustainable development goals so we do not really have a prioritization but the two main issues that we find in the social space tend to do with youth unemployment and crime and violence yeah in terms of intergenerational equity we have no issue and there is no differentiation as i've said it is a quality of the project that determines how um, the selection is done at the end of the day and we are open to the range of the 17 sustainable development goals right and you have just one more um Laura. there's another or Another. Or organizations with capacity and governance brought into the JSSE. What is the process? Okay, it's a simple process, very easy. We have a website, jsscja.com, 
and you visit the website, our application materials, directions, forms are there. You simply download and you submit an application. The process starts when you submit the application that you're vetted at the administrative level. And we are not about rejecting projects. We are about assisting so that everybody will be able to proceed in delivering what is their mission that they're after. So even if you are not selected at the first go, we are committed to hold hands and to help you to fill your gaps so that you'll be able to have the capacity that you need, which is why part of what we do is training and capacity development. So once you do the application, there's a vetting. And after the initial vetting, it is submitted to the board at the board level where we have a selection and um, listing committee and the final selection is made there. When the selection is made, that's when you are put on the exchange, meaning now the stamp of the JSSE is on your project. So you are put to market like we do on the junior market. And it is when you have attained at least minimum of 80% of the funding that you are listed. And it's similar to the IPO placement that we have on the junior market. Yes? Excellent. Excellent, thank you. And Charmaine Brim says, indeed it has been. I mean, it has been a great um, two days. I look forward to getting the presentations. Excellent job, JSC, JSSC. Um, of course, Carolyn Hale is saying, thank you all for two days of enlightening information. Um, Denise, excellent presentations on both days. So again, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, let me just, on behalf of the Stock Exchange, Jamaica Stock Exchange and Jamaica Social Stock Exchange, thank all the presenters over the past two days. You've been great. You've provided um, enlightening information that is of great quality. And for that, we wanna thank you for helping us to enlighten and to inform our participants and to you, the participants, it could not have happened without you. So you are always very important and you've been a great um, team of participation, that participants that made this workshop a wonderful success. And we thank you for having attended. And we look forward to seeing you at other workshops likely to be put on by the JC or the JSSE. Again, thanks to everyone who was a part of this successful two-day workshop. Thank you for coming. Have a wonderful rest of the day and a great weekend. Thank you all. Thank you.